Today, I would like you to encourage you to think big, big as in uh, big data. And uh, I'll try to um, present an example today um, that uh, in a short period of time, leveraging actually today's technologies, you can very fast develop solutions that could highly impact your business. Uh, but before I start, I would like to ask you, uh, how many of you have heard like, about creative, creative Cloud, Adobe's Creative Cloud, Creative uh, Document Cloud? Yeah, so many of you, hopefully. <laughs> how many of you have heard about Adobe I.O.? Well, it's kind of a, um, it's something new. It's a new team that has been formed. It's, um, it's been around for a few uh, years, but uh, not many of you maybe uh, heard about Adobe I.O. So Adobe not only presents or um, develops applications, but also provides APIs. So you, you could, for example, um, integrate applications with the Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, Document Cloud, and Marketing Cloud. And um, um, Adobe I.O. provides documentation and uh, different developer tools so that you can integrate with the Adobe's APIs. So let's say, for example, that you want to develop a mobile application. You would have an SDK, um, and you could process images with the SDK that we provide. You could send us the images and apply filters, and then you, could, you can uh, get the image with the filter supplied. Or you can create a, a desktop, desktop application uh, integrating with our document cloud API. Just send us a document we're going to process in the cloud, and uh, we can uh, give you the response, the, the process document. So you can, um, you can use the, the Adobe APIs. But kind of the core component of Adobe I.O. is the API gateway. What is the API gateway? It's uh, actually the entry point for all these requests that are made to the uh, Adobe's APIs. Um, so this API that we have uh, developed is, um, is on top of Nginx. So this is you know, the engine of the uh, API gateway, Adobe's API gateway is Nginx. So a few of the functions that the, uh, the gateway has are validation, of course. So we can do um, request validation, authorize and authenticate um, the, the requests. Um, we can do with the, with an, an, um, the Adobe API level, we can uh, cache the, the, the request so we can you know, present the faster response. Uh, we also uh, offer like uh, survey throttling and rate limiting. And if you didn't see the presentation that my uh, colleague had yesterday, uh, Dragos Descalitza, I would encourage you to just uh, you know see the video afterwards, uh, where you can see exactly how you can you know configure that, and you can run a bunch of nginx instances and uh, you know apply that for the entire cluster, apply rules for the entire cluster. We also do tracking and monitoring, and actually the logging part is going to be the main focus of this presentation. Um, so we, know, we understand the power of the bazaar. Uh, and uh, in comparison to a cathedral, uh, we have um, you know, developed all the modules that we have created around Nginx, uh, we have open source. So I just uh, invite you to go to GitHub and search for um, Adobe API platform. And all the, the modules that we have created over the years are, are there. So you would find the API gateway, which is actually the core component having built on top of Nginx. We have also like, built everything on top of OpenResty. So uh, the main language that you, that you will find there is Lua. And the, the modules that I've already described, uh, you, you'll find there. So the, uh, the request validation, so it's an extension of the API gateway and the cache manager. Also, um, our entire infrastructure is on top of, so we deploy everything in AWS. So we have built the module for integrating uh, with the AD AWS APIs. Um, and the last module is the one that I'm, I'm going also to you know, present some snippets, uh, some, some code examples uh, from the async logger. It's the one that we, we're using in order to send all our metrics, the, the records, um, to, uh, to Kinesis, which is another service from AWS. But I'm going to talk about that uh, later on. So we process about 600 million requests per day uh, today, but that number is uh, going to uh, in increase uh, in the following months just because we're continuously on onboarding new customers. And uh, what we'll have, you know, 
on every single request that we're sending, we'll, on, after getting the response on the, uh, on the logger phase, we're just uh, generating a metadata that is being sent to Kinesis. Well, you could argue that you can send that to uh, a, diff a different uh, you know, stream bus. You could use Kafka for that. But just because we do run everything in AWS for us, it was an uh, uh, you know, easier decision to just go with, uh, with Kinesis. I'm going to explain why. But, you know, what happens is that at the end of the day, you just have data, you know, lots of data. So having that data, you can build a very interesting, a very nice and powerful ecosystem around that data, you know, such as debugging applications or analytics or monitoring. And why not even, you know, change the business model? And uh, as you know, Adobe has been one of those companies that has evolved um, um, uh, over the years. So we've, we've kind of switched from a boxed uh, licensing, you know, model uh, where we switch to a subscription-based model. And that has been, you know, very beneficial for us. If you look at the numbers, like the stock price is in less, like, uh, since we started in 2013, that has highly increased. Uh, you know, uh, there's a very good slope there. So, you know, having this data and processing this highly amount, like, the amount of data, you'll end up, you know, kind of uh, having another business model, which is the consumption billing. You know, you could... Um, um, you know, bill your customers for, for the requests that are making to the APIs and not for, you know, subscriptions or uh, other models. And in order to, uh, you know, process all this, this data, you have a, like a big landscape here. I would just give an example of 2016. And as you can see, you have so many tools, so many open source projects that you can use to process, you know, and store uh, the data on a bigger scale. And uh, it's a much easier uh, task to solve nowadays. Uh, it has been maybe more complex in, in the past, but today have everything. You have like companies that have, you know, build, uh, are being built around, you know, uh, different technologies and you can, you can use them as a third party provider. Um, so it's a much easier task to, to solve, but when it comes to, uh, to the tools that you're using, every single one has its own flavor and set of options. So, you need to choose the, the you know, the best uh, configuration for your application. There is no silver bullet for an, any solution, but you need to, ch uh, to choose carefully. Um, and um, a few years back, uh, Carl Sagan was saying, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And it's kind of true, you know, when it, also when it comes to, um, you know, these, the, the the Nginx data, and you do need to construct the entire big data ec ecosystem around it. So the streaming application and, and kind of processing the application with the tools today, it's, it's a kind of an easy task, but you know, having it ready for production, it's, it's uh, somewhat challenging uh, because you do have to architect the entire cluster, set up the applications, and uh, you know, performance tuning, performance tune these applications is sometimes tricky. So in the next slide, I will present our solution. And um, I, I don't believe in perfect solutions, you know. So then I, I do think, as I mentioned, I don't think there is a silver bullet there for everything. But the example that I'm going to present has been kind of validated with uh, some other uh, companies in this industry. So it's, it's been, uh, been very beneficial for us. So I'm just, uh, just going to give you uh, uh, our solution. So of course, we have started like with, with the Lambda architecture, and the Lambda architecture has uh, three main components, three, three layers, and that is the, the batching layer, the service layer, and the speed layer. And um, I would argue that there is, a, there is another layer that you have to take in consideration, is that is the streaming layer. And um, what we do, we send the metadata from, Kinesis, from Nginx to Kinesis, and the reason why we have chosen Kinesis is first, we, we run in AWS. Secondly, th that's not the very, uh, it, so the, the service is not very expensive, so um, it's relatively cheap. They, they work with shards, and one shard is, uh, costs about 10 bucks a month, so uh, not a lot there. It's deployed in all regions where we run our gateway, so um, it's, um, uh, it's there for us uh, to, to use. And um, they have a lot of libraries you can integrate with them, it, 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 with any, any programming language that you, that you want to use uh, Kinesis with. Um, 
I was saying that I'm going to present some snippets of the code that we're using for, for the Nginx configuration. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the project is open, open source. So the logger configuration looked like this. There is, a, um, you know, but before that, there are some, some requirements that you need to uh, consider when, you, when you're dealing with Kinesis. So they do, in order to put records, or send records to Kinesis, you can use two methods, put record or put records. You can only execute a put records method with uh, 500 records in that particular uh, request, and to up to 1,000 records per second. So that means that if you kept the, the 500 uh, records for the put records method, you would then up, end up sending just two requests. But you can increase the number of shards, and you can provision actually your entire infrastructure by, by buying more shards, by uh, you know, uh, increasing the number of shards of your Kinesis stream. So in this configuration, we have, um, you, you have the flash length, which is um, you know, because uh, all the records are, are being buffered and are just, um, you have your flash length, which is, is going to be 500, just because uh, we want to keep that number in the Kinesis parameters. <coughs> But if you use another technology, you could, you could do, use some, some other numbers here. Um, the flush interval is five seconds. And what it happens if, for example, uh, you're in a region that doesn't send so many records and you don't cap that 500 all the time, in order to have a real-time application, you still want to send the records uh, you know, after an interval of time. So that's important for your real-time stream. Um, we have the flush concurrence, um, so that is the flush interval. Um, the flash concurrency is how many threads you can use in parallel in order to send uh, requests. And uh, entire flash throughput would be 10,000. So in this case, um, given the, the, the Kinesis constraint, you'll, you'll have to have at least 10 shards in order to process the entire volume of data that, that you're sending. Shared dictionary is actually the, the place the, um, um, where, where the cache is constructed in memory. So you store the records there. Um, another important aspect when it comes to, to, to the communication with Kinesis, you can only send a request from inside the same account to Kinesis. In order to, but the, the problem that we had is that our entire cloud, so our entire configuration is one in one AWS account. So the analytics part, this, uh, the insights part is, is in one account, but all our gateway collections are being deployed in different, uh, in different accounts. So in order to be able to interact with, uh, with other accounts, you do need to use the, um, the STS service, security token service. And that will allow you to generate some temporary credentials uh, that you can use for up to an hour, and they're, they're going to be renewed. But like this, you can, and before that, you have to build a trusting relation, a relationship with that account that is able to you know, send you data to Kinesis. So um, we do have to allow that particular account to send us records. Okay, but again, that is, that is nice. So we have the, the service, and we're, I'm going to talk about the application also, but we do have, like, where do you run your application? You have applications. You have to have a cluster, you know, underneath, so that um, you're in, that, that provides CPU power, memory, and, you know, storage. So some of the, uh, the elements that you have, uh, again, to think about are, you know, it has to be very easy to scale up and down, just because when, when dealing with, with uh, big data, you can have spikes, you know. So you, can, you have to be able to you know, increase um, very fast the, the capacity that you have. And you also have to have like, uh, areas for stateless and st stateful uh, you know, uh, applications so that you can deploy your applications uh, in a stateful or a stateless manner. And the solution that we use at the moment is actually, again, an Adobe uh, solution that has been developed uh, by our friends and uh, the team from Marketing Cloud. And we have contributed with the API <coughs> Gateway. But the way it is, it's very, sim it's very simple, uh, simple for us to just spin up a new cluster in AWS and um, just with a few commands. What happens, we build a kind of a BP VPC. And then we have two subnets, a private and a public subnet. And uh, for for the resource man management, we use Mesos. So um, current, kind of our entire cl cluster runs uh, on Mesos. And the, the, the idea behind the cluster is that you have these stateful, stateless uh, workloads. And um, uh, the entire cluster is called a cell OS. 
So you would imagine as a cell, it will have a membrane, you know, kind of the communication with the outside world, have a nucleus, which is kind of the core, the, the brain of the entire operation and the, you know, coordination of, of the cluster. But we still have some other, you know, components there. So the nucleus is actually the one that is the brain of the entire cluster, and it has the HDFS name nodes for the stateful, um, for the stateful body. It has the zookeeper uh, and the Mesos master, which will, which will kind of you know, coordinate uh, all the, um, um, the entire cluster. Then you have the stateless workloads, and the, uh, state, so the stateless and the stateful body. And these are just for running different types of applications. For example, you def deploy a microservice that doesn't need storage, doesn't need persistence layer, a persistence layer, then you will go with a stateless uh, body. But if you do need to store data, and we do uh, when, when running our Spark applications, uh, and I'm going to show that uh, in, a, in the next slides how that works, when you need, need that, then you run your application inside of a, inside of a stateful body that has an HDF, uh, HDFS uh, uh, name node underneath, so you can store data um, um, uh, distributedly. And the last piece of our um, um, cluster is the membrane. And on the membrane, we have the API gateway, not to be confused with the gateway that we have uh, at the Adobe I.O. level. That is a different gateway, but it runs kind of the same application. And uh, what it does, it has auto discovery, load balancing, and uh, you know security on top of it. So this gateway knows how to you know discover all the applications that are running in our cluster. So when you deploy a Docker container, it will just you know know where to go, and it will um, it will be available just by writing the uh, the name of that application in the URL. So. The next, uh, so actually the, fir the first layer in our, uh, um, in our configuration would be the speed layer. And what it does, it reads uh, directly data to kin from Kinesis and everything that is uh, being stored there, everything that has been generated by Nginx is being stored in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is our, our, our decision to, uh, you know, to store data, our persistence layer. Um, I would, uh, of, of course there are some other solution uh, out there and um, um, you could maybe like one of the questions could be why not using you know HBase or Cassandra or anything else, but I argue that in, in this case Elastic uh, Elastic Search makes more sense just because we do want to be able to you know um, have also debugging data available. Elastic Search uh, built on top of Lucene has some very good searching capabilities there, so you could uh, you could you know store everything inside there, even non-structured data. Uh, in Elasticsearch and you'll still be able to search uh, for that data. But we have the consumers, and the consumers at the moment are just simple Java application that read the data from Kinesis and store it one-to-one -one in, in, in the speed index. Um, the, uh, the only thing is that we want to build an entire, you know, much more in this part of the, the, the architecture and in, in this part of the pipeline. And here we just want to build monitoring and you know like um, a lot of tools that will allow us to uh, kind of understand the traffic and uh, send notification in case something goes wrong before you know other tools find out that something is not correct in the pattern. Another layer is the batch layer. And the batch layer is uh, constructed uh, by s some components, it would be the, the Spark streaming application that reads directly data from Kinesis. And it will store this data into HDFS, which is our, um, uh, which is our uh, persistence uh, layer. And the, the Spark streaming application is nothing else but a Docker application that we deploy in Marathon. Um, so Marathon and, and Kronos are uh, two of the, the, you know, they're, they're helping us a lot in order, for example, with the Marathon, to, to run long running tasks. So for example, if the Spark application dies for whatever reason, uh, Marathon will take care, you know, restarting the application. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, can, you can continuously run that application if you, even if uh, something happens. And um, I would just encourage you to always checkpoint. So we do checkpoint at the, the Kinesis level. That's kind of been done automatically, but we're checkpoint, checkpointing also in Spark. So even if the application restarts, we're still going to be able to not lose any data. What happens, though, when you restart the application, you can still have the effect, and Kinesis uh, kind of... Uh, represents that in the documentation, you can still have 
uh, the effect of duplicating the data. So you still have to, in your pipeline, somehow dedupe the records that you're, you're sending. Uh, you will not lose records, but uh, you have to take care of the fact that some records may be sent twice. We do store um, everything in a parquet format, and uh, this is a, um, a columnary uh, storage format. And that is um, very efficient when it comes to size. So it will compress very well the, the, the records and the, uh, the data that, that we're sending. And also it's very fast when it comes to reading. So it integrates very well with Spark. So uh, that means that you want to do kind of a search uh, after that on, on uh, high volumes of data. Parquet would be a, one of your best bets here. So we had uh, a very good experience with Parquet. And, uh, we continue to use that, that format. What happens, HDFS is actually just a temporary layer. So we're just using this uh, for, uh, I don't know, a few days. And then everything else, all the files are being backed up in S3, which is relatively cheap again. So you can, you can store there for a longer period of time the data. And even if you have to go back you know, into a month and run some, some, uh, some searches, on top of that data, you can still do that in, in, in S3. Um, then you will have your, like, we run another application which allows, which our, is our uh, uh, Spark SQL. That is, again, a Docker contain, container, but we don't re run it in Marathon. We run it in Kronos. That is just an application that starts on uh, different intervals of time. And that, that, that application does nothing else but aggregation at the moment. So <clears throat> all the records that we have are going to be aggregated hourly, daily, monthly, um, uh, that, that configuration has to be like uh, application specific on, uh, but we, you can do aggregation and then everything that has been generated from there is being stored again into Elasticsearch. What you end up at the end of the day is actually your uh, OLAP uh, data cube. And of course, just by going, you know, like uh, this is a matrix and you can search for a particular um, information for that count of data for the aggregation just by going, you know, selecting the time of day or the time of, uh, you know, month, the consumer service. And here is just one example with three uh, dimensions. But we have actually a hypercube where we store in the Elasticsearch multiple dimensions. <clears throat> I think there are about 11 at the moment. So having this um, will highly decrease the, you know, the volume of the data that you store, but also a very fast, you'll be uh, able to also do very fast searches uh, on your data. Uh, on the speed layer, so uh, when, when, you start, when you store everything that you have from Kinesis into Elasticsearch, uh, that there you will have some performance problem if you want to do searches on, on a billion and billion of records. So this is the reason why you always have to do uh, aggregation here. And of course, you can um, kind of filter your, your, your data, roll up, drill down all the specific OLAP, uh, uh, you know, um, executions. So Elasticsearch, um, on top of the Elasticsearch, we have also kind of constructed the uh, very thin API that doesn't have to be complex, at least not, not in our case, that connects to both of the indexes. And then that API is behind the, uh, the, um, the API gateway. You know, when we have you know, policies, um, like uh, agreements with other uh, services so that we can provide that data. You know, using a service token, you can, uh, you can allow the, just that, that particular service to make calls to, uh, to your API. Well, another important aspect when you're dealing with the data and processing the data is testing. And how, how, you, how do you do testing? You know, when, when you have like a, lo a lot of moving components, when you have like a huge cluster uh, behind it, how, you, how do you test your application? So I would argue that every single application that we've built here can be tested. You know, like you can build, still build uh, unit tests inside your Spark application, of course. Now, like you, you do need to do that. Uh, um, you can also, um, uh, you know, build a lot of tests as you would do with a microservice around that Spark application. But when it comes to the entire pipeline, when it comes to the entire application, uh, uh, the entire pipeline, you would, uh, your, your bet, best bets uh, here would be the performance and functional testing. And we have tested our cluster with uh, about 80,000 requests per second. That is, that is kind of the ingestion rate that we can, uh, we can handle. And uh, with a max maximum throughput of uh, around 110. 
So um, we see when it comes to the real-time traffic, uh, real-time layer, uh, every record that um, reaches our Elasticsearch and can be uh, can be searched in, in less than one second. So, um, but that's you know just a configuration that we have. Um, of course, you can increase every component in that cluster, you know, in order to uh, in order to be able to process even more. And uh, you just have to increase the number of nodes that you have in Elasticsearch, or just have to increase your number of executors in Spark. And you just need to, to provide more resources, and that would be uh, enough to just uh, to have better or higher, even higher numbers here. The part with the, the, the functional testing, so, Nowadays, you do have uh, like the Docker, and that has been very beneficial for us. Like, you can you, we have Dockerized every single component that we have, and you can. Um, so we have developed an application that what what does it mirrors uh, everything that you have in the cluster, you know, on, on, on the on the on the cluster side, but you know, compact it and, ha and have it run on your on your machine on your local environment. So you, you, this application, what it does is starts all these Docker uh, containers in a Docker Compose mode. You send traffic on one end on the, onto the Nginx, and you expect on the Elasticsearch to get the numbers that you, uh, that you need. So um, and this, this application, or the, this part, I'm going to just uh, demo, demo it at uh, the end of my presentation. Um, the canary testing uh, application is uh, it's another microservice that we have developed in order to be able to very uh, to react very fast to uh, what is happening in our cluster for example if one component dies or something goes wrong, wrong uh, then you can um, very fast find out so your canary application does send traffic uh, on particular interval of times to the nginx um, and, and on the other side, it tests that that record or that number of records has reached. And we, we deploy this application also in stage and production. And uh, that every single time something happens, the, the, the kernel application will send a notification and we can react. What it doesn't do is doesn't tell you particularly which component has failed or which one is uh, you know, problematic, but you still, um, can, you still know that something is wrong and you start debugging and troubleshooting for uh, what is going wrong. So at the end of the day, what you, what you have, uh, so kind of the uh, results of everything that uh, we have built is you can build very, uh, very powerful you know, um, um, charts or you know, analytics on top of the data. And here is just an example of the, the Kibana dashboard where, where clients or our user or service providers can, can go and search for uh, you know, particular uh, requests that have uh, passed our entire uh, our entire pipeline, and we provide the analytics for the service provider, but we also provide the analytics to our developers. So, if you want to start, you know, using the, the Adobe products, you know, the APIs in different types of applications, you can you can go to Adobe I/O, create an account, and you will see, you know, the requests um, that you have made to our to our APIs using the Unified Developer Portal, and. Um, um, also, what you end up with uh, having at the end of the day will be will be kind of a um, kind of a way of allowing the service provider to send you know a, a bill at the end of the month uh, to to the customers you know saying this is the amount of requests that you have have been using. So this is the the, the business model part that I was talking about. So. Maybe some of the question will arise: well, Why building this solution? Why not, you know, store the data into? You know, there are a lot of SaaS app, like services there that, that allow you to store logs, allow you to, you know, to send send, send the logs, and uh, you, your DevOps can just can go there and, and search for them. I would argue that this is not just a you know a debugging application or de debugging environment, but it's also an analytics environment. So it has multiple components on them. It's pretty easy to send the data somewhere, but it's uh, kind of the data is the most important part, uh, at least in our example. And you can do a lot of things uh, around it, and you can build a very powerful application around the data. And it's uh, easy to send it, but it will be very hard to get it back or to uh, you know um, build another solution if you have started this path. But we still use you know we still use uh, third-party services in order to do debugging, uh, even even nowadays. Even if I would. I would say that maybe in the future, we'll, everyone in our company is going to be use, uh, using this uh, solution. Um, and uh, 
also in the past, like we've we've tried multiple solutions. This is not the, the first one. Uh, we've been, for example, uh, in the past sending the records to Graphite, which was like just like one instance, as you know. Uh, and um, the 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 biggest advantage that you have at the moment with such an architecture is that any component that you have seen before here can you know can die at the moment in, in time or can fail. You can still reconstruct everything while the kinesis, your streaming layer, is working. You can still go back, you know, and process everything on on a month level or on an every day level, and uh, and uh, yeah, the it's very resilient from from that perspective. The next step that we're going to do, and this is the, the part that uh, we have already started, and that, um, maybe at the next conference I'll, I'll be able to talk more about this one, is the monitoring. And the, the, what we need to uh, analyze here is to analyze the traffic, and in case something, something goes wrong, um, send a notification. But what is wrong? What is normal? You know, that, is a, that is an important question to ask when it comes to you know, traffic, streaming traffic. So, uh, what you would you have to do here is like build some forecasting methods, you know, uh, in order to analyze traffic and forecast what's going to come. What's what's your next number uh, in in the values that you're uh, you're seeing in your data pipeline? So maybe just one naive example would be to just have a moving average for for uh, that particular you know for the number of requests and see or for the error rate. You know, and see uh, what is happening there, and then in, if that spikes, just uh, you know, notify or something. But you know, you could have events, and uh, this is just an expected uh, thing to happen. Uh, but um, uh, just just calculating the moving average uh, won't help here. Um, so that's why we need to move to uh, much more complex, you know, so solutions, uh, and we have to take into account the seasonality and the historical data, and, and build uh, the entire machine learning environment uh, around it. So what I will do now, I will just uh, um, have a short demo uh, and uh, kind of present how, at the moment, we're doing testing on our local environment using, uh, uh, using the, uh, the, the Docker Compose for these applications. And um, the configuration that we have is not different than the one that we have, for example, in production at the moment. It's kind of, kind of the same. We have been, uh, so for the testing environment, you, we're using Kafka. And the reason for that is, um, it's practically impossible to use Kinesis on the local, local environment, even if there are some libraries there that say that they allow you to do this. Uh, you still have to, you know, have those, you know, account names and numbers, and you still have, it's pretty tight integrated, the, the, uh, the Kinesis library with the entire AWS um, uh, service. So um, that's why we have uh, chosen Kafka, but it's kind of the same thing. You know, we're still sending records. We don't do anything to those records, and we just uh, process them. So um, the configuration of this, uh, is the same. OK, so I will just uh, start my application now. Mirror the, so I can see everything that you see. Let's increase this. So uh, what we do have in our application is, um, as I mentioned, it's just uh, Docker Compose, just starting all these applications at what time. And this is what it. So you will have your um, uh, Zookeeper that is required for Kafka. You will have your Spark application, the API Gateway, the Elasticsearch, and even Kibana. So that you can, uh, you can uh, at the end of your application, uh, you, you can see how many records have been processed and how, how many records you, you have there. Um, this is just a simple example, and I would use uh, for the, this time just a JMeter to send uh, the numbers so you can see uh, how, how that is being uh, uh, processed. Um, I would just wait to, for the cluster to start. Yes, so um, also the JMeter, and this one doesn't uh, do anything else, but you know, it does some HTTP requests on a local host port 8081, which is, um, which is actually our, 
just an endpoint configured onto Nginx. And we send, when you send requests to that particular endpoint, uh, some metadata is going to be generated uh, and uh, sent to Kafka. And uh, we have configured to send uh, 100 requests at the moment. Those uh, has, have been sent, and I will just manually start the aggregation. Normally, it will be a bash job that does that, but you, um, I will just start, start the aggregation application that takes the, uh, the parquet files, does some aggregation on top of them. At the end of the day, we'll just end up with one single record in the, uh, in the Elasticsearch, having the entire number, of, aggregated number of those requests that have been processed. So the Spark uh, SQL will do its job. And what it does, uh, it sends the numbers to the Elasticsearch, and it stops. So you can configure your application to send, um, uh, to, be, to just start and uh, run on different intervals um, just by <coughs> batching that application. And uh, if I go, for example, in HDFS, you'll be able to see uh, in the, in, in the browser, which are your, uh, um, your data being stored. Like we do, for example, on daily aggregation, we have you end up with a, lot, with a bunch of files. Uh, that can be automatically stored to S3. And in Elasticsearch, you would get one index um, with, um, with the entire data that you have processed. And at the Elasticsearch level, we'll just have in, in Kibana, for example, you'll have two records just because I made a manual request. And uh, the other request only has the number, of, the, the count of records that you have be, being processing. So we do have, like, these are all the dimensions that we store, but um, normally in a production environment, we'll just, you know, have so many customers and so many uh, services that you're, uh, you have to store. And, uh, but the advantages of ag aggregation are great just because you will, you will end up with one single, single document in Elasticsearch as for 100 in this, in this case. So you can definitely decrease the storage capacity and the uh, processing power that you need for search after that. So this is kind of the, uh, um, the solution that we have, we have developed for processing of data, integrating with Nginx. And uh, if you have uh, any questions related to this one, I'll be happy to answer in the a few minutes that I still have left. If not, I'll, I'll still be around so we can. We can. Yes, of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't know how these are going to be available, uh, but I know that we received a notification that or email that we're going to provide the slides, and some they're going to be posted somewhere. I don't know where though. Okay, there are no questions then. Thank you very much, and. Um,